Well, everybody, welcome to today's In Conversation, the panel discussion led by Dr. Joe Melvin, director of the estate of Barry Flanagan. My name is Eric Gleason. I'm one of the senior directors at Casman. I work very closely with Joe on all things Flanagan. I have the pleasure of introducing the panel here, and I will be back at the end of the event to pose some of your questions. Uh, you can use the chat function or the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to send these over throughout the course of the conversation. Uh, this event is in celebration of the recent extension of our ongoing Flanagan exhibition. Three monumental bronze sculptures were installed in the Casman Sculpture Garden uh, right before the pandemic hit and now will be on view to the public through April 2021. Uh, the Sculpture Garden sits on the roof of our flagship gallery at 509 West 27th Street and can best be viewed from the High Line between 27th and 28th Streets. Uh, to see the works, you, know, you can visit the High Line freely during the week or you can reserve an appointment for a weekend trip at thehighline.org. As of right now and through this Sunday, we are also screening a trio of Flanagan's film works, which together illuminate the artist's pataphysical philosophy, something that I'm sure will be discussed uh, between Joe, Jamie, and Alex. We will be showing you how to access the screening later in the conversation. Uh, these digital events are hosted under the umbrella of Casman Verso, a multimedia editorial series that aims to offer deeper insight into the work and practice of gallery artists. To access a captioned recording of this event, please check back on the Casman video, Vimeo page on Thursday. And now to introduce the panelists. Joe Melvin is a curator, artist, and writer, um, reader in fine art at Chelsea College of Arts, UAL London, and director of the Barry Flanagan Estate. Recent exhibitions include the Barry Flanagan Retrospective at Icon Gallery in Birmingham, 2019, and The Hair is Metaphor at Casman in 2018, both of which offer new insights into the interconnectedness of distinct periods of Barry Flanagan's 40-year career. Since the early 1970s, artist Jamie Nairs has investigated, challenged, and expanded the boundaries of multimedia practice that encompasses film, music, painting, photography, performance. Nairs has been the subject of numerous solo exhibitions, including at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and in 2019, a career-spanning retrospective at the Milwaukee Art Museum. At the end of this November, the Met projected Jamie's work Street under the side of the museum for three consecutive nights, uh, and Nairs has been represented by Casman since 1991. Alex Bacon is an art historian based in New York City, who was until recently a curatorial associate at the Princeton University Art Museum. Alex regularly writes criticism and organizes exhibitions, both contemporary and historical art. Among his publications, Bacon is co-editor with Hal Foster of a collection of essays on Richard Hamilton, published by MIT Press in 2010, as well as the author of texts in various exhibition catalogs and edited volumes on artists such as Francis Elise, Mary Course, Ad Reinhardt, Neil Taroni and Stanley Whitney. I'm now going to pass it over to Joe Melvin, who will lead the discussion, and I will return uh, to pose the questions at the end. Everybody. I'd like to start off by, by saying thank you very much to Casman Gallery for hosting this event, and I'm delighted to be joined by Alex Bacon and Jamie Nairs for our discussion. Who is Barry Fannigan? It's really easy to forget or overlook his early work or how he was known, how popular he was with his contemporaries because of the, what he's best known for now, which is his much loved hairs. Um, he, he, I'm gonna give a few little anecdotes to give a, a feel for, for, the for the character and attitude that Barry Flanagan had. Um, even before he came to New York City, Christine Kozlov and Joseph Kosuth sent a letter to Charles Harrison, who was the assistant editor of Studio International, saying that his arrival was greatly anticipated. And when he arrived for the first time, he met up with Dorothea Rockbourne and Mel Bochner, who remarked in a letter to Barbara Rice, an American writer and historian, that they liked the shape of his mind. He was friends and competitors with Walter de Maria. They stayed in each other's respective cities in, in their own, in their houses. Flanagan described how on one occasion, he, they played the drums on the carpet of his living room floor in Camden, 
uh, imaginary, of course, for several hours. And when Flanagan was asked to show again his one room sand sculpture, he said, no, I'm not doing that again. De Maria has now made a bigger one. The Earth Room. He was friends with that whole generation of his contemporaries and his support and encouragement of younger artists, ideas and projects became legendary. So we're now going to uh, begin our discussion around the roof exhibition of 2020. Now, this is a, uh, this is a, this takes Flanagan back in a sense to his ideas around the monument and what is monumental. Ideas of, of the disappearance of monuments, the fragility, the temporality, and their, how we perceive them in time, through time, whether we're talking about sand or bronze. What were your feelings around these works? We could go a little faster, I think, with the slides, just a little faster. Here we have the, the return to Rodin with the, the figures on the, on the gates of hell transformed. I like it when they do these dances, like it's kind of, Memento Mori, Dance of Death. Yeah. The, yeah, the dance, yeah. Um, there's a wide range of expression from one hair to another. I hadn't appreciated it until I started looking at the work more closely recently. Yeah, and the, and the sort of paradoxical character of of the hair's presence on, a, on an object that is actually functioning in a different fashion. I mean, here you can see in the background, you can see the anvil and then the hair rising up out of the anvil, boxing. But this whole kind of gestural relation to where an idea comes from, where does it sit in terms of the, the processes of creativity is something that's being investigated with through this hair, which is a creature that with which we can associate as as people because of its figuration. Well, I think this is a nice slide in particular, like this grouping that you put together, Joe, in the Kasman show a few years ago, because for me it shows what you've often tried to argue for, this continuity of concerns with materials and process and even illusion within, you know, the space of his career. I think What's interesting to me that I'd be interested to hear you talk about maybe a bit more is for me, what the hair seems to represent is, you know, not so much a sort of clean break, but this sort of shift from maybe more sort of internalized, more abstract sort of metaphorical content, such as the spiral form, which I think was carved into some of those rock sculptures and into the hair, which, as you've said, is a sort of very immediately recognizable, identifiable sort of figure with its own sort of lexicon of meanings. And so it shares that kind of allusive um, metaphorical content, and yet it has a sort of directness and forward-facingness in terms of the literary content, uh, which seems to be maybe the newness of that work when it arrived around 1979, and I'm, I'm sort of curious about that in the context, because you spoke very nicely about the early work and its context of other artists like De Maria um, and so on, but I'm curious also about the context of 1979-80 and this sort of new interest that emerged around monumentality, a term that you use, which again was something that maybe, again, those artists of the 60s and 70s would have not have wanted to address and yet, obviously, the late 70s, early 80s, we see this shift more broadly in art towards this feeling that expressiveness, that figuration, that monumentality and history could be engaged with in new ways. And I wonder if maybe you could also talk a bit about, um, you know, Flanagan within that sort of bigger context, because I think wasn't weren't the first hairs shown in Zeitgeist, some of the first hairs, um, which the of course is a seminal show. 
the first hairs were shown um, in that was a little later. The first hairs mm -hmm. were shown in um, in in Waddington Cousteau Gallery, and then it, they were included in the in the Venice Biennale when uh, Flanagan represented the UK in 1982, and then they were included in the in the in the, in the show that you're referring to um, and the um, uh, documenter show. Um, it, was, that, yeah. it was a noticeable shift when he began to do that. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. And I think, but I think what was very, what, 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 what sorry. In yeah. some, to a lot of people. Yes, I uh, think what is shock, absolutely shocking. And I think that there are several layers to unpack here quickly, obviously. Um, one of them is that it was shocking to a number of people when they when they encountered a sand sculpture on a carpet in a gallery in London in 1966, um, you can imagine that carpets on the gallery didn't sit very easily with sand. So that was, in a sense, what we could describe as um, the initial response of the public was mystification, celebration, fascination, and shock, you know, um, being taken unawares. So the shift into using a different medium, which appears to be sudden, was in fact not sudden because Flanagan had experimented through all different media, all different applications of things like customizing ropes and sand, as we've mentioned, um, and other, other things into his practice. So the sort of what we could describe as the traditional elements of sculpture, even early on, as well as materials that weren't then associated with sculptural practice and ways of ex experiencing space. For example, having little bits of canvas pinned on the wall or on the ceiling and on the floor, and then having a much more spatially obvious or explicit encounter with these, with these um, hairs that we see here. I think the other thing to, to mention, or there are several, but I'll, 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 I'll try and put them into nutshells. Um, the preoccupation with the hair is also something which, at the time of 1979, there was a, a general, it represented what, what was in uh, across the board with a number of artists, a dissatisfaction with the way that certain attitudes of conceptual art or whatever we want to call that, that whole kind of movement um, had become over aestheticized and over pure. And so the, the sort of return to a more visceral and alchemical um, preoccupation, what we might call a mytho mythology, was something that we see very much amongst artists from that time. I mean, you see it emerging in artists like like Joseph Boyce, you see it in, for instance, in the in the UK, there was the exhibition A New Spirit in Painting around this time, which had artists who were returning to figuration due to a dissatisfaction with abstraction because of how it related to other people. Um, Flanagan himself was extremely concerned about the way his work interfaced with people he encountered, with the public. Um, and this included works that were cited in public spaces that were, in a sense, constructed as kind of monuments, which is an interesting uh, con construct because they were made of sand and cloth and so were necessarily fragile and necessarily temporal. Um, and these early sculptures, a number of them, were destroyed by by angry members of the public. I mean, for instance, there were some sand sculptures on the beach in Cornwall in Hollywell, which a bunch of soldiers pushed over and destroyed during their, during their tactical, um, you know, during their tactical advances to each other. But it was, it was a willful act. And then outside Camden, there was another sculpture, which was also destroyed. And another one in Cambridge um, in, a, in a big exhibition in 1972. And to go back a little bit earlier to the preoccupation with monumentality, to come back to what um, Alex was talking about, and there's the sort of shift towards the monument or absent monument 
that happens amongst those contemporaries as well of Flanagan's in the end of the seven, at the end of the 70s and into the 80s. I mean, I'll just recount a brief anecdote to this because in 1968, Flanagan had his first exhibition in, in Italy, uh, first solo exhibition at the Gar Gallery Arietta in Milan. And it was literally just after um, Fontana had died. And Flanagan had a very high regard for Fontana amongst a number of other artists to whom he made various types of homage. And at, this, and, uh, at the opening of this exhibition, Flanagan swept up a pile of leaves. Now, this event wouldn't have been documented had he not spoken about it and relayed a couple of people who had been there. So he made this little installation of the leaves, the fact that they are autumn leaves and the fact that they were obviously kind of, you know, blow away straight away, you know, it also reflects this idea about permanence, monumentality, preoccupation and homage or homage, as we want to call it. So sort of returning to a, uh, either to a celebration of a contemporary, someone whom on a Mars, or going way back, like we see bits of sort of classical sculptures or bits of repurposed objects, which come from a very different epoch or time. It seems like those um, ideas of the metaphysical ideas or pataphysical yeah. ideas uh, had been percolating a, a while before they came into the opening um, in a more yeah. direct way, perhaps, with, with the appearance of the hairs. Um, yes. Despite yeah, very the, much so. I mean, the, the, the titles the, of the earlier pieces are, are obviously a, a reference, but it was seems more embodied in the work where the hairs appear. But the um, it's a it's kind of a seamless. You can move from one. I lost you. <laughs> uh, you um, um, <laughs> what uh, happened? Yeah, uh, I'm here. I crashed. <laughs> I'm back. Good, good. <laughs> Let's say yeah. the, the arms, the limbs of the hares are just like those Hessian sausages that are wrapped. Uh, there are similarities in form bet between them and the um, earlier work also. Um, yes, yes, very much so. And in the, in the way that they're actually fabricated. So. You, you see the, the signs and traces of the armature in many of them. Um, and, and also the kind of imprint or the, the print of the, of the casting. So it's very present in its physicality. And if I could pick up on something you mentioned earlier, Joe, about this sort of need to reinvent at a certain point and reconsider certain positions. I think that was also a larger uh, context in the late 70s, early 80s, which I think is sometimes less discussed. I think a lot of, you know, Flanagan is not the only artist who was perceived as making a radical shift at this moment, which perplexed critics, which were, of course, used to a certain narrative, which by the late 70s had become quite canonical about process, materials, directness, and so on. And I think, you know, you can see a number of artists, to think of two quite disparate artists, you have uh, Robert Morris, who in the, by the late 70s was embracing history painting, was embracing these kind of crazy metaphysical construction slash painting objects. And then closer perhaps to Flanagan, at least geographically, art and language, which you know many people think of as the most dry uh, form of conceptual art, the most didactic. I think that they felt the need to show that it wasn't about a dry didacticism, that there was always a sort of playful interest in, you know, text and language and meaning. And so they also in the late 70s started to play with history, to play with, you know, not only uh, art historical figures like Pollock, but also historical political figures like uh, Lenin. And I feel that maybe Flanagan might have had this same sort of feeling of the need Again, like these artists saw the, all of them saw this as a continuation of their investigation through other means, right? They didn't want people to become 
you know, used to what they were doing. They didn't want their ideas to become sort of, um, you know, static. They felt that in a way they almost needed, I think, to choose a very different formal approach in order to sort of reinvigorate the same ideas which they had always been interested in. And I think this is a sort of lacuna of a lot of art historical thinking, which can sort of not understand that sort of shift within a practice formally. I think, yeah, there was a lot of playfulness in itself became um, a respectable element to bring into your work, I think. Um, and you see it in many places. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I'm yes, thinking, that, but... yeah. When perhaps, uh, Jamie, did you feel this in your own work as an artist working through that same period, I mean. I did. I felt, you know, I thought this was like the late 70s and I was, um, I took a hard right turn and started making narrative films. And we opened a little cinema on St. Mark's Place and showed our own, own films and the films of our friends. Mm -hmm. And, but looking at those films in the context of things that I've done, you know, I'm another artist who appears to have done many different things. Mm. But um, I, the thread seems quite clear to me, and I think to other people too, once they've looked at it. Um, but that, yeah. one, that was a time when it seemed like the whole shebang was shaken up and tossed in the air. Like no one quite knew what anyone else was doing or what they were doing. It was a great time. It was very inventive and unpredictable. And I think a lot of artists changed their tune. And maybe again, a few years later, you know, artists change with the times. So I think often art historians have a hard time with that because they like to sort of see these, you know, apexes within you know, the ideas. And when artists say things like, I'm trying to reduce it to its basic form, its most direct expression, it's then very hard for art historians to read that and then see a later embrace of, say, figuration. Yes. It seems inimical. But of course, yes. as you said, the artist is constantly needing to change. And often those, I think those experiments which art historians privilege most highly are often just that. They're experiments. They're sort of gestures towards you know this sort of con condensation of ideas but they're not often what drives i think the artist's motor i think the artist wants usually a more complex you know engagement of these ideas and so you have things like the malevich black square as a sort of unicum of his production but it's not as if he just painted endless black squares that was a sort of reduction of language which then he multiplied into a sort of beautiful narrative that again, another artist who we see shift in a way that seems quite radical and yet is, in the end. you know, yeah. Also, yeah I, think, I, I, think, I think this that the, what you're saying about the, the, the art historian's preoccupation is also often the, the case with, in, in terms of how any artist is perceived, like how they should continue to make work in this way, whereas Actually, they may well not, and why should they continue to make it in this way? So this sort of feeling of quite a conflict within, yeah. the, within yeah. the mind of an artist, and and of course the market has some bearing on it too. Yeah, of course, of course. Oh. And then, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I was I was, I was just saying that uh, there are many reasons to have trouble believing in the shift that you're about to make or yeah. to be fearful of, you know, doing something. Something new. New. Yes. I mean, I think what you were saying about the, the playfulness and, the, and the, the, the sort of excitement of the end of the 70s, which, which allows for that playfulness, which actually has a very pataphysical quality in the sense that it's, it's quite paradoxical in, in how it's, situating itself and it's it's critiquing itself as well as being itself um and in a very natural way and i and the 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 way of writing about this about an artist who's already known for a particular 
a particular way of making work is then being subverted. And that in itself is, is quite a playful and a humorous thing. But don't try and define how I'm working because you are me and I'm making my work. And he had a tone uh, of irreverence in his work from the beginning, like with the bollards. Yeah. Um, yes. Going out a sort of gorilla sculpture. Um, I love exactly. that, that whole exactly. series. And we were the other day talking about bollards and what they do. And I, I realized that they, they restrict traffic. That's like the main, you know, it's to, pre it's to prevent uh, street corners from getting bashed up, but it's also to restrict traffic. Yes. And that's a political statement to not yes. want traffic restri restricted. Yes, exactly. Uh, and there's an element of that. I, it's wonderful to see him feverishly sewing away in the back of that truck with the cement mixer and everything all intact. Yes, yes, right. exactly. We'll, 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 we'll move on to the, to the film fairly, fairly soon, I think. And to see them, to see them. Yes. It was a great shot for me. I mean, I guess, yeah, yeah like you were saying, um, many of the materials are so time referenced in themselves. The, the Hessian, which is sackcloth, mm. and the colored Hessian, which the, the dyes, um, mute so quickly in, in daylight and the sand which is just made to d disappear and yeah. um, those transient elements of the of the work are so important and I don't think they really disappear uh, just by being cast in bronze at a late you know uh, at a later time um, yeah, I agree. And I think that something that is quite remarkable about them is that they're extremely subtle. These, 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 the, the cases of deterioration or so on, but they're also very explicit. So yeah. again, there's that sort of playfulness that, that we see, for instance, with when you were saying, um, Alex earlier about, about art and language, you know, the, the humor and the fact that it's being perceived as being dry, academic, but actually it's extremely playful and very funny. Even work, works like these, if I may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The humor here, it's, they're delightful. <laughs> they're delightful, they're hand-sized, they're completely mysterious. Yeah. And you kind of know exactly where they come from. And uh, these are beautiful, these little, I, 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 this is your catalog from the show, but these, sure. these little clay works are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that his, his respect for Rodin was so strong. Um, well, and that's fascinating too, if I might just say those works to me are quite surprising because we talked again about monumentality in this show that's on at Casman right now of these sort of large scale bronzes. Yeah. And then it's interesting that they're preceded. And again, I know that there's never any you know, it's not as if he only made one kind of work at, at any stage. And yet there's this moment again of the sort of mid late seventies where he's playing with these very small, very um, humble in a way constructions like with rocks and, and again, the clay pieces and, and their works that are almost, I mean, you could say again, another theme through a lot of the work is these works that could almost be uh, mistaken for being nothing at all, just two rocks perched upon one another or a little pot that, theoretically anyone could make there's no sort of grandiose statement and so it's amazing that he can go from that all the way to these sort of beautifully highly produced hairs which again as you said do have those elements then if you look closely like they aren't just totemic they have those elements of process and and the the means of their making and yet again you see the breadth in that which is quite astounding that he can go from the most minuscule and unassuming to the most sort of you know, grand and fantastical. And, and, yeah. and grandly absurd in many ways. Yes. Yeah. But always, they need in a way that absurdity, it seems. Yeah. That's great. But, but also you see the, the bar they're very much, all of them are very much to do with their making. So the, the traces of the hand, whether it's 
in the earlier work or whether it's with the later work and the, and the hairs, we have these, you know, the, the, the trace of like how it was made. You see the fingerprints, you see the, 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 the imprints, you see the, the mm. hand going in to the, to the cast. And, and that immediately puts the viewer into the position of a direct encounter with touch, which I think mm -hmm. is always there, as you were saying with the, with the earlier work. And, and must have been something he, he loved about Rodin. Yes, absolutely. Same. Well, shall we, shall we bits of, sorry, Alex. We, just one more quick comment uh, just about that idea of the, the hand and, and making. I think for me, that's also what makes, because again, if we think about this history of the monument, it's this sort of inaccessible totem to like a past and a sort of static idea of history. And I think that sense of touch and making invites us in as viewers. It sort of allows us an access point and it sort of takes down a notch the sort of monumentality that we might associate in a sort of old fashioned sense with the work. I think it, it adds to the playfulness and it sort of, I think, involves us in the narrative. It kind of makes us co-creators on some level of the work and its meaning. Yeah, very much so. And it, it's sort of a, it's a return to a sort of primordial element. And there's a primordial kind of reaction from viewers. Once a, a bronze sculpture has been in place for a long time, they always get touched. And they always get touched in the same place by, by people. And they get polished, like the knee or the, you know, the breast or, you know, the... Um, not necessarily the obvious places are touched by the same people over and over. That always fascinated me. Yeah. Uh, um, the people want to touch the thing that it shows yeah. touch and is made with touch. That it's a connection that the viewer re responds to. It's a problem that you know people like Richard Serra have with with the beautiful <laughs> those beautiful. <laughs> Um, surfaces on the steel plates, which people want to touch them, <laughs> and they leave horrible fingerprints. And, uh, but it's a, it's a connection, you know, it's a natural connection to an object. But, and it's and it's always ongoing. It's never fixed. Yes. And that's 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 also very interesting. I mean, the fact that it, they can be the same people, Jamie, or they can be you know, new people going to touch it. And it's across a period of time. Yes. 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 Like if you walk around Venice, every yeah. little brass or bronze um, thing, whether it's, a, you know, um, a, a position on a, on a railing or a, a sculpture of which there are many, they seem to have all been touched by people in the same way. Same yeah. different time. Yeah, rather wonderful. Yeah. So, shall we move to seeing a few little clips of some of these films? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They're great. They're yeah. irreverent. They're funny. They're beautiful. They're unexpected. The gorilla. Yeah. They they're... arrive at different times of day. Yes. <laughs> and and there's a dialogue set up with the official ones immediately. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. I may be a fake, but I I'm just as important, if not more so. <laughs> yeah. He looks a bit like John Lennon in that clip. In that <laughs> yeah, he does. 
this film's wonderful. And I had forgotten about it until I saw it in your show. This, this film was, um, was filmed um, with, with Gary Shum and as part of the Land Art, um, the Land Art TV exhibition. Uh, which was first broadcast in 1969, and this was filmed in February of 1969 off the coast of, of the Netherlands at Scheveningen. And uh, actually, Jan Dibbets was also making a film in the same location at pretty much the same time. And so they were that they were there together. And in fact, um, one of the one of the things that Flanagan remembered about it particularly was how acutely cold the seawater was. And what is what is what is um, fascinating about this project is the, the the method in which they managed to achieve this bird's eye view. Which to go back to the idea of the spiral, you have here with the with the almost as if a plug has been taken out of the sea, and the water is going to go round according to gravity, the gravity of the plug, as opposed to the tide. So you have this kind of conflicting relation between the tide, which is obviously controlled by the moon, and the and the the the, the, the um, magneticism of where you are in the world with a spiral coming in, and they they achieve the bird's eye position by um, by commandeering a, an old um, an old uh, fire engine from the local from the local station and put, a, put the camera, suspended the camera al along on, on, the, uh, on the ladder over the water so they could look right down on it. And this is all... This is the image inside the, the spherical image has a kind of planet-like quality. It, it, it does move into a, from a negative space into a kind of positive space occupying that place at times in the mind, it has a, which I like, it's very planetary. Yeah. I like at the beginning when you see him pushing down the sand. So he wants to get it just right inside, nice and flat. It's a good, it's a good detail um, before they even start filming. When these two films are, are interesting to watch back to back because I think of them in a way, uh, the sculptural element, the bollard in the first film, and then now we have this plexiglass um, uh, column, is they're both props in a way. I mean, we could argue maybe that the bollard is a sculpture, but I think, of, of course, Flanagan must have known that they would not last long. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, the film really is the sort of object here. It is the sort of result. I mean, there's clearly why he wanted to film it and film it in a particular way is because it was a sort of document of what was inevitably going to be a brief sort of ephemeral uh, gesture. And then here you have this amazing, of course, collaboration, as you mentioned, between Gary Shum, who of course pioneered this idea of artist films, not just as artist films, but as specifically for television. So this idea of a sort of mass audience. And I think you get this sort of amazing, like almost uh, music video length, right? This like four minute long clip. So it's designed to be digestible and quick. It's, and it's also very much a collaboration between a filmmaker and a sculptor. And so this sort of object is a prop and then it's being sort of documented in its activity by Shum. And I feel again that there's probably a lot of Shum in the kind of staging of the shot, as you mentioned, quite athletically um, achieved. And yet, of course, the idea is characteristically Flanagan and there's nothing about, um, you know, the film that sort of contradicts this sort of terms of, of Flanagan's work, which again are often between the sort of solidity, which we see in the, the form of the column and the sort of mutability, which we have in the tide. And then, you know, which is not true of all the films that Shum did. I think Buren, for example, revoked his film later after yeah. the first screening because he wasn't happy with it as a sort of expression of his own work, at least out of the context of that original staging. And so anyway, there's lots we could unpack about yeah. the larger context of those. But this Sand Girl film is to me then fascinating because you're getting sort of another, in a way, prop, like the, the female body here 
And there's a lot we could sort of maybe discuss about the politics of using the female body in the way that it's used here by Flanagan. Um, but it's very interesting, again, how the film often seems to introduce for Flanagan a different way of engaging, right? Like temporality is often part of the work, but in the film, he often achieves a form of expression of temporality that is hard to achieve, let's say, within an exhibition context. Um, because, yeah. you know, outside of performance, which I think Flanagan explored at least early on with his sound poems and things like that, it doesn't seem to be a form that he may be privileged later on, and yet it appears in the context of, of things like this film, Sand Girl. Yeah, but, and, we have, and we have sculpting in action. Yes. We have, we have the, the, you know, the processes of actually making a sculpture and, and, the, and the, the sort of the, the reversal of, of the materiality or, or transformation of materiality into something which is other than what it was before, but also remains what it was before, which, is, which takes us back to what you were saying, Jamie, about the, um, about the inverse in the, in the water created by the, the sort of inverted bollard, which is going downwards, whereas the bollard is going upwards and this kind of contradiction coming yeah. this way. And then the, the process of the production of the work, which is from interior into this external circumstance with which we encounter it from the other side, on the other side of the skin, in a way. So we're going kind of within the skin of the production of, of the sculpture, within its durational <laughs> aspect, which is being documented by something which is necessarily showing its duration and is, is putting us into the frame of, of making the work, the experience of making the work. I guess the celluloid of the film is a kind of skin too. The, yeah. uh, the, um, I like that he doesn't, it's not like a, illusionary. He's not into creating an illusion. He's, he's create, uh, he's, he's, he, it's like phenomenological fundamentally. He wants you to see what happens. Yeah. He doesn't disguise how he's doing it. He shows you how he's doing it. And still it becomes magical. And um, I, I, I think the, something that interested me with Sangal was that he made, he made it uh, quite after, I, I, as I read in the bio, um, he'd met Ava Hess and she, and she had died very, th around this time. And I yeah. was wondering if there was any kind of reference to that. But, you know, it's easy to imagine references that... I was also thinking of that English pop singer, Sandy Shaw, who yeah. always sang barefoot and, um, and was big and, uh, you know, would have been very much known at that time by, by Flanagan. I don't know, they're just kind of crazy references. No, I, I, they're not crazy at all. I think they, they take us right into the, into the sort of centrality of practice, the, 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 uh, the, compa the, the connection really between Ava Hesse and, and Flanagan was, was really palpable when they met the, for the first time. And the, I mean, I think you're, you're right. I mean, it's not written as such, but the element of what comes below the skin and how it, how it comes out, that's yeah. sort of the encounter, the experiential of spending time with someone in their studio and, and being of, with such rapport with the in investigation of materials and it, their primordiality. And then, yes, there the must be, an, and, and with barefoot as well. I mean, Flanagan, and, and to go back to Flanagan himself, was, was a fantastic dancer. So that you know, <laughs> the experience of, of moving in space and the body in space, the feeling of one's feet on the ground, these are yes. all very important too. Well, and I like this film too, because there really is, I think, actually an underlying irreverence. What Jamie was talking about, how this is not just a documentary like he you can see again that he's roving around the body and sometimes it feels very purposeful and sometimes it feels kind of abstract. 
And I like also how the model is not a sort of perfect, pure substance, which I think is how we maybe get away from some of the potentially negative connotations mm -hmm. of using a female body in this theoretically passive way. Like I like, for example, that she's wearing this necklace, which I found very distracting in the first because it's this kind of like, you know, I don't know, bright, garish necklace. It very much stands out. It's not something you expect from the sort of, I mean, as is, again, this filmmaking, which we're seeing even that right now in the film, yeah. it's not this structuralist film like, you know, Michael Snow wavelength, like steady fixed shot. It's not Richard Serra's hand catching lead either in terms of a film about process and materiality. It's yeah. this kind of, you know, sometimes you feel like there's the necklace and you think like, what is this? doing here and I love also at the end she starts to like move her thighs and stuff so there's again not this like perfect model who's just standing static there's this disruption like he's introduced the body as a form of disruption he hasn't told her lie perfectly still oh no you move we're going to reshoot it he's again he's happy it seems with whatever happens and I then love again maybe we'll see it at the, the, the ending of the film because you kind of get this buildup of expectation and you think, well, she's probably going to get up at the end and she does. But what's amazing is she doesn't really leave anything behind. There's no conclusion. There's no like imprint of the body that was the point of this whole action. You're kind of left with nothing, just with sand in a completely um, arbitrary uh, com composition. Yeah. which of course is caused by the process, but which has no aesthetic seeming value. And he doesn't again frame it uh, visually in any aesthetic way. And I think it relates to Hole in the Sea where again, he removes the tube at the end and you're left again with nothing. Like I like that idea, which you could I think extend to the baller, this idea which is not realized in the film, but which we know that soon the bollard will cease to exist, that it's this sort of gorilla in position that ne inevitably will disappear. And there's that, sense in which in the arc of the film by the end we're sort of left like with just that you know the period of the film was it and at the end it's it's gone like we've witnessed the duration and at the end we can see the duration has ended there is no extension or conclusion it just ends yeah i think it'd be good if we could move to the end of the film and just see that see i that. like the, I, it's like the piles of sand that he took two or four scoops out of a yeah. kind of arbitrary mm -hmm. act and the the body itself becomes arbitrary in a way and he keeps the camera in very close most of the time uh, which again abstracts what you're looking at and and when, and right when she does move it's not like a body imprint she leaves behind she leaves yeah the, it's, it's more about the um the shifting of the sand as she moves yeah, the tr and the, tra the trace of her presence. Yes. Like, which, which is, yeah. Which includes her movement. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't necessarily know that a body was there if you hadn't seen. Like, if you just saw this frame, you wouldn't yeah. say, oh, a body had laid in the sand. You would just see sand. Yeah. And it looks like the sand's already trickling, you know, under its own gravitational... Right, Hole in and takes over and wins at the end, which I suppose is true in Hole in the Sea as well. Like the ocean yeah. takes yeah. over and overcomes the human, the sort of humble, again, a humble, both of these are very humble interventions which are shown to not transcend really again, you know, the, the natural forces that they kind of intersect with briefly. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and it is, it's sort of it's something that, that features in a work around, made around the same time when Flanagan took photographs of where people had laid blankets down on Hampstead Heath. And so mm -hmm. you can't see at all that there've been people there, uh, but they are, they are um, that the, you know, the grass has been flattened down. And so he was looking yeah. for where there had been these, these blankets, and people lying there or having picnics there, and that trace remained. So you wouldn't know, just like with the sand, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know when you when you see it like that in the hole in the sea there's a, there's a number of things i love about that film another one is the different shots combined yeah and he pulls back sometimes and then he goes in close and then 
he moves around. It's never like perfectly centered on the within the rectangle. It has a, a an organic kind of quality which is reflected in its the yeah. making the filming of it. Yeah, yeah. The fil and the and the relation between the filming and the editing, which you see with with the sand girl, it's being edited in camera. Whereas, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, I also find it kind of amusing. Um, in a, you know, British uh, in particular ha uh, has a delight in a kind of um, a pseudo or kind of faux science and yeah. the inclusion of the times of day, 1324, yeah. 1356, yeah. is a way of giving it a kind of um, uh, a structure tied into one's sense of measured time. Yes. But it really doesn't matter. It's like it doesn't matter that it's 1356 or 1327. I don't think. It's well, I think that's the amazing kind of collaborative element of that film where you have Gary Shum, who I think has a much more sort of rigid conceptual uh -huh. art sort of vision of like time stamping, fixed shot, yes. the sort of cold documentary aesthetic, which we see is not really at all part of, of uh, Flanagan's aesthetic when he's a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah, I think you see the intelligence of the collaboration because Flanagan is making a very simple gesture, but he knows that it will play well and it will play in tension, as you're saying, with mm -hmm. those sort of forms so that, you know, when those forms like the time stamping are introduced, they become sort of ironized. And again, the playfulness sort of comes out, the humor comes out, which mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't in, you know, in place of another artist's work. And so it's a lovely, collaboration there, I think. People who, who would believe in it too much. Yes, yes. yes. It's, like, it's also like a sort of, you, you, we also have this sort of critique and, 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 uh, and, and ridicule of systems, systems yeah. of measurement. Yeah. But it appears to be rational and it's actually right. pulling it's the rug from yeah. under your feet. Yeah. This is serious, you know, this is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would be nice to move on to the, um, to move on to the, 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 the interview. Mm. The interview clip. With Melvin Bragg. Melvin Bragg. Good. Yeah. With Melvin Bragg um, speaking with, with Barry Fennigan in his in his studio in the foundry in in London in January. Uh, it was broadcast in January nineteen eighty three, but it was filmed the previous year. Can't hear the sound. We can't hear it. Could you take it back? Yeah, thanks. What attracted you specifically to sculpting hairs? I did see a hair and was most impressed by its gait. Um, I was traveling uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Sussex to Cornwall and um, this um, hair was uh, running along just beyond the hedge. I was traveling at about 30 miles an hour or so and I had a good look at this um, hair. And um, there were three figures, one of which was a dog, uh, coming over the brow of the South Downs, and uh, they were literally walking a Labrador. But uh, the hare was there and was coursing along, rather leaping. And so that was it, hare, leaping hare. It's a nice, it's a sweet little, non-eventful story. <laughs> I, I saw a hare in a field. Yeah, exactly. And three <laughs> figures, one of whom was a dog. Yeah, that's great. I well, think it's good to note that there were other animals that he sculpted, which I think you see in some of those installations. With The hares are iconic, but there were elephants and horses and yes. tigers and all sorts of things. Exactly. I, um, there was a list of um, qualities of of hair or um, positions of the hair in different cultures, yes. uh, cosmologies and stuff. And yes. I 
particularly liked the observation that the hare is the only animal that sees a fire and yeah. runs towards it to yeah. escape it. That's pretty smart. Yeah, it's very smart. And actually that book came out in 1972 and Flanagan uh, had a copy immediately. Um, and, and he was very familiar with, with country, the country life of, of hares, uh, gamekeeping, poaching, getting yeah. hairs in, in pubs from people who'd been poaching or legitimately getting a hair. I shot I hairs in my day too. Yeah. Well, dare I say it's a very British sort of moment in an artist's work who didn't necessarily embrace a kind of British aesthetic. I mean, again, I know that the hair obviously exists outside of Britain and, and he's talked about yeah for example, the Chinese mythology around it of being of interest and so on. And yet there is this sort of interesting turn to the pastoral and to this sort of, I think again, the hair may exist elsewhere, but it's quite iconic as I understand it within the UK. And so I wonder if that is somehow of, was of interest to him. It's not something I Definitely read of it. The land, the land, you know, the land and our nurturing of it, the landscape, the territory. Uh, the whole, our whole sort of interaction with with the the ground and the, our fellow creatures, and of course they go mad in March. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I I believe we may have time for a, f a few questions. Is that correct, Eric? Yes, indeed. Yeah, we had a, a number of lovely questions come through. We won't have time for all, but uh, I'm going to cherry pick a couple. Um, would Flanagan have considered to the, there to be a difference between public art and art in public? Uh, well, that's a that's a sort of uh, a tricky a tricky question, um, mm -hmm. a sort of symbiotic question. Um, he would consider there to be a difference uh, between art in public and public art. Uh, art in public implies making something in public perhaps as well as uh, a more interventionist a, yeah yes yes uh, which which you see with uh, with the bollards um, and public art is art made for the public domain and i think that one of the things that Flanagan was very concerned uh, was the relation to the actual site and the specificity of site so it being involved with the site itself before it is installed rather than having something just bought off a shelf in a sense. So, yes, I mean, it's a, it's a very big topic and absolutely he would see a distinction between the two. And a more permanent relation yeah. to it. Well, it does seem that he also approached very actively, as you said, Joe, the siting of the work. And so there's those lovely which uh, earlier interventions, which I think the Ballard film is a perfect example of, right? These kind of, maybe that's art in public, right? It's not art that is commissioned and yeah. sanctioned, and yet it appears in public. It has this sort of accidental um, audience, we might say, like people who just happen upon it and don't necessarily even understand its sort of art context. And you can see that there's a lot of works like that. You mentioned again, these sort of sand um, formations on the beach in Cornwall many examples of him sort of intervening into public, um, the public domain, uh, sort of uninvited. And there's a lot that can be said about that. And then I think you see, there's also a whole thing to discuss with, you know, when he receives those commissions finally, when also public art uh, commissions sort of shift towards embracing artists like Flanagan, which I think again, sort of corresponds to that 70s, 80s period that we've been discussing when the hairs emerge, I think there's actually, again, a lot to be said about the hair as this navigation, again, of like appearing monumental, but then that absurdity. And so again, he's playing on both sides yeah. um, with the sort of terms, right? He's sort of imposing monumentality when ephemerality is also at stake with the art in public. And then he's also introducing absurdity within monumentality in public art, sort of in the more official sense. And then there are other pieces that kind of ride the edge, like that commission uh, to go in Cambridge, which yeah. was the four or five sacks of sand 
with the long thin one across the top, which, as I understand, was quite quickly vandalized. Yeah, very. Is that quickly. the Camden one or? No, it was in Cambridge. It was part of the Peter Stuyvesant City Sculpture Project. It was really beautiful and yeah. nicely yeah. sort of, you know, it sort of, it leaned in from the sides. It had a sort of an Egyptian yes. um, to, to, totemic quality with this one lying across the top. It was really something to look at. And um, I can see it being ripped apart probably by people playing on it more than it would actually they were called people were called to to destroy it although they may have destroyed people there was a there was a priest a vicar who in in one of his sermons uh called for he said blow up this revolting art so who knows whether that made his congregation go out and do it or whether he was actually um, expressing the mood of his congregation. Plausible Deni deniability, I think. Yes. But leave it to the church. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. I like that one he made also, the um, two, uh, two presidential elections. Yes. That's a really yes. um, complex yes. kind of trope. Uh, and, and an interesting object, too. Yeah. Very complex and very, very, you know, using, using bronze to actually pose these two political positions in a very unexpected fashion. Pretty good. We have a, a pataphysics question uh, coming from one of the attendees. We'd be interested to hear a little more on Barry Flanagan's interest in pataphysics, specifically how its expression through the earlier works changes over time and translates into the hair sculptures in later works. Well, I think I think it's it's interesting to note that that Flanagan's preoccupation and and interest, relational interest with pataphysics, began when he was a student, uh, when one of his one of his uh, friends from uh, poet friends sent him a copy of the Evergreen Review that had been dedicated to pataphysics in the in the early sixties. The, the thread of pataphysical interest is in is in the the, the subversion of material, the humour. The preoccupation with the spiral, with positivity, negativity, which runs its course throughout all his practice. And conundrums and double meanings and... Yeah. Yeah. And the science of imaginary solutions, which yes. is extraordinary. Like you were saying, Jamie, about that, that moment of liberation in the 70s when you could actually make whatever you want, do whatever you want, screen films with all your yes. friends. Yeah, imaginary. Yeah, imaginary solutions, yeah. which become realizable. Yeah, uh, every solution is imaginary in its infancy, I, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, with that um, sculpture that was destroyed in, by the soldiers on the beach, it made, it made me think of Napoleon's soldiers using the Sphinx as target practice. Yeah. <laughs> that was off, you know. Yes. You can still see the cannonballs. Extraordinary. Yeah. That is remarkable. Well, yeah. that history of, of these, of sort of public art, quote unquote, as a sort of site of vandalism can also be rewritten in certain ways as it as a sort of site of, of alternate realities that in a sense, these people, which we again think of negatively, and, and certainly there's, you know, there's not a positive in the vandalism, but yet, they are, I think, responding in a way to this alternate worldview. And I think your wonderful anecdote, Joe, about the pastor sort of gets to that, that that worldview was seen as alternate and thus threatening. And so often I think the vandalism is this sort of negative response to this sort of alternate worldview, which again, is, is often only amorphously understood by the vandal and yet is very much a response to that sort of, you know, contestation of, a reality which again for certain people is repressive and then for others they sort of want to uphold that sort of structure and so on yeah and that sense also of the critique of monumentality i think we see this with these recent uh, critiques especially i think both the uk and the us have seen huge uh, critiques about these uh, monuments to histories of colonialism and racial violence and the yeah. fact that these are not just simple like yes we take them down it, you know, it shows that there are a lot of people that are, of course, threatened by, you know, shifting that sort of worldview. And I think, again, 
these, and you see again, these alternate monuments which have sprung up, for example, in the UK have then in turn been vandalized. Like again, that threat to, you know, envisioning a different world is, continues to be threatening like this. That's why we can go back to the example of Napoleon and the Sphinx and we can go to our present moment and, and also talk about Flanagan's because this is a sort of recurring issue in terms of the public sphere and what kind of representation and meaning can be made there. Yeah, um, I, it, you make me think immediately of Carl Andre's um, bricks that caused such a <laughs> squabble yeah. in yeah. London when the Tate bought it. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And I, 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 I know we need to close, but it's a, mo a wonderful moment to close when we would love to continue talking our discussion. And thank you both so much for joining thank me. You. And thank you, um, Eric and Molly and all the team at Casman for hosting this event. It's fantastic. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Joe and, and Jamie and Alex. Wonderful discussion. We're left with a backlog of questions, which speaks to the vibrancy of the talk. Um, just a reminder to everybody, the, uh, the film screenings will stay on the Casman the Gallery homepage, accessible there through Sunday. Um, and uh, any other questions, you know, feel free to, to send them to the gallery, info at casmangallery.com. We'll do our best to get them answered. Thank you again, Joe. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you. you.